people, um, and people of you know, councillors, please, if they want to see what's going on, more could turn up on the bikes. Um, but one of the, you know, what, what I'd love you to do, supposing it went ahead, what would you be doing during the week? Just give us some highlights of the projects. Tools, 
ovens, um, we've got a sour, dead, a sour bread maker uh, who's going to the different uh, community gardens and kitchens to do cooking and it's um, a way of hopefully doing consortium bidding to upgrade some of our community gardens and see if we can create any services that could be could feed into things like Neo Cafe and the other sort of initiatives that Andrew um, is working on and Frank's working on. So it's, we're trying to bring it together. It's the first meeting, so we're still exploring what the benefits could be, uh, but we're trying to make sure it fits in with the Feeding Bank Ahead campaign and it's all sort of linking up together. Joe, can I, I mean, it's like a focus, because I'd like them in here, because that would be relevant. There we are. Um, there was a piece in The Guardian a couple of weeks ago about a town in Spain that while, you know, we had a really good report back about use of waste food from supermarkets, their supermarkets put outside chill cabinets and they, each evening they put out the food which would otherwise be wasted and people could just come along and help themselves. Because there'd be some clever objects, there'd be a lot of people who are And I just wonder whether you might ask, you know, we're talking about food corridors, whether that might be a possibility here in Birkenhead as an idea. But we, Andrew, we've got lots of offers, didn't we? When firms, when shops um, upgrade their equipment, they offer to us, which we then, through Feeding Birkenhead to other organisations, fridges <coughs> and meat and chill cabinets. And I'm sure we could actually do that. Oh, I've already uh, tapped into some Marks and Spencer chill Yeah, yeah. Oh, they yeah. have been on my terms. Of course, we have five massive fridges yes. beforehand. I know. Penny has us freezers. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so could you just think about it? I mean, just as, a, a, as an experiment, you know, so that nothing, given you made the point, didn't you, and about just how mega the waste is okay. of totally edible food in Birkenhead, and yet we've got a lot, certainly just talking about a number of kids who are hungry during the holidays. I would um, just say to yeah. Council Mayor, I'd love to see that, as a constituency, I don't know how you do it or what you call it, to get all Um, 
provide a number of services to families of children under five. Um, and one of those things that we've been doing since 2010, we were commissioned by Public Health to provide a breastfeeding and post-net service. But one of the things that we identified very quickly is if we didn't get in much earlier than that, at the antenatal stage, then we weren't going to help increase post rates. So, um, Birkenet constituency funds us last year for 10 months to do an antenatal pilot in Birkenet district. So, just um, so I'm
Um, but the ones that we did see engaged fully and we never got um, a family decline that information. Even if they didn't really want to breastfeed and they were a bit standoffish to start with, it's about making an informed choice um, and they all engage with the information at that point. Um, they didn't all take up the offer of support at that point of contact, but they were given contact details if they changed their mind, if they see us out of the house, if they got a little, just a dissolved information a bit more, they could pick up support at a later date. And I think this your last point is, is key, especially with their their district. Um, it was about being the person that came to the antenatal clinic appointment with the mum. It was about her mum, it was about her partner, it was about the person that she was close to, she was getting the information from. And if your mum, your nan, all bottle fed, then that's where you're taking your set point from. So I think a lot of the engagement was done with the person sitting behind the mum. Um, so we were trying to break that default setting. Well, I bottle feed because we all does, and we all bottle feed in our family, and nobody really in our area breastfeeds anyway. So why would I want to step outside? Um, families who signed up for offered sessions of antenatal education, everybody feels the need to engage in a different medium of support. Some people benefit from a group setting, um, others want to one home visit. Some don't want you in the house. That's fine. You know, but I'll come along and I'll get the information there. Um, others just want to talk on the phone. Um, but it was about drifting that sort of information along um, so that they felt informed and, and they were happy with the choice they made when they arrived. Um, we also developed a text buddy service. Um, it really sort of simple format of text systems that instead of trying to go over everything in an hour um, contact or a 20 minute contact if you're in the 20 minute scan room, um, we would give them a little bit of information every single week via the text and this was run by a volunteer um, and it would just be relevant to the point of pregnancy but also to the outcomes that the mum could be able to achieve by giving any, any amount of breast milk um, and I think you know, I took a, a small study from the cohort of text buddies and we had 21 families that I looked at and 15 of those initiated breastfeeding just from having this information and they used to say to us on the board you know they was here and I'm really going to miss my text I really enjoy getting a bit of information every single week. So that moved from 20 weeks to 37 weeks, and we really like to roll this out further. Um, why didn't it work as well as it could have? Uh, well, a lot of the time access was, to mothers was restricted. As I said, we, we did sit there for three to four days for eight hours. Um, sometimes we might see one or two mums, which was a massive waste of, um, of staff time and uh, volunteer time. And also the mums were in there, they were moving around and the maternity unit, but actually they weren't being brought around or I think a lot of the time the way you sell a service, the way you educate it, you know, I know you're all bottle fed, but you want to listen to the woman talk about breastfeeding. No, you know, this is your maternity package, this is what you're entitled to, you know, this is about making an informed choice. So I think the cell we need to engage better with the cell. Um, and even for health visiting, so we had quite a low um signpost to the fail rate from the health visiting service. So, with the frustration of knowing we had the information but we couldn't get it over to the mums because we couldn't engage them, we worked, I would say, in the past two years, Bev, on a, an opt-out policy. So at the moment we have an opt-in, so the families need to know about us um, to actually get support. But what we've now worked on is an information share of protocol so that we're an opt-out. And we're giving the details of every single family from the 12 week point. Um, and then we are. Can I say that's only happened in the last month? In the last month. It's taken us that long to get How long has it taken them to get that point? Well, two years. Yes, about two years just to get to that two years of babies have lost out. Yeah, and that's come from, uh, we went really closely with the hospital um, and different barriers, different things going on, meetings upon meetings that Bev and I have attended. Um, and what's actually happened now is we got it from the health system service because we are an early implementation site. Um, and we do get antenatal contact from our health visitors on the Wirral. We've been able to pick up that literature from the health visit service. Are we ready for the public health? Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah not when did that start then? February. So it's now part of the public, it's a council service, isn't it? Yes, yeah, uh, we're in that partnership as well. That's why we've been able to do this because we, the 0 to 19 Healthy Child Programme came out of contract. Community Health Trust got that and we're part of that partnership uh, and that's under the Public Health yeah. Authority. So that's opened the door for the information sharing post well, and things will improve even more when we move over in January to System 1 which is the electronic database. Um, you know at the moment we're still 
I had some bits on how to share the information, so it means information governance. It's all just relative. <laughs> um, so, again, it's enabled us to have an opt out system rather than an opt in. So, those historical low norms and referrals should be addressed. Um, and we've seen a massive increase in the number of families engaged with support. Uh, but we're not able to draw off statistics around initiation of families at the moment because we've only had it for a month. Um, but it's probably when those um, emails come in, we've got a lot of literature on. Um, and I think now we've got the information, what do we do with it? Um, and it's not just about having a one to one, especially as I said in the, in the Birkenhead district where we're dealing with a whole ethos of bottle feeding and it starts right from the beginning when they're playing with bottles and you know, you buy a, a, a baby doll that doesn't have a bottle with it in the shop, you know, you can't find one. So they're invited, antenatals are invited to the postnatal groups, so mums during pregnancy actually come and meet other mums who breastfeed, and a lot of these mums have never seen anybody breastfeed a baby, so we're asking them to do something that's totally different. Um, so we run our antenatal education alongside our postnatal groups, they can come in and speak to real time names who are doing at the moment. Um, more points of contact in the deprived areas, we've started three more breastfeeding groups uh, in the Birkenhead district and they are hanging out the door. Um, you know, we have 15 to 18 mums at the home start or near Tramia Rovers. Um, we just started one up in Brassy Gardens Children's Centre. Um, you know, that's having four to five months at the moment, but it's quite a new group. Um, and again, that antenatal education. And then Rock Ferry Children's Centre. Again, we struggle to get families in. And once they're in and engaged, you know, they do initiate and they do continue to want to meet. Um, and everything else, you know, it's not, I think, trying to increase these rates with a, a car getting a part of a big wheel, a big machine, um, you know, and alongside the health visit with the midwifery staff and FMP and teenage pregnancy. Um, we need to look at being versatile and, and, and meeting the needs of this community. So they do it, engage with different sorts of medium support that suits um, them. So it, it, we've got to be flexible in our approach to meet everybody's needs. We have um, a Get Real uh, Breastfeeding Facebook page, and there's 691 followers, and they're all with families. So we can post up stuff, research, evidence based stuff all of the time. Um, and they can contact us for support on there as well, and uh, I'll answer that over with a couple of the other feeding team. Um, when all the breastfeeding mothers have their own Facebook page, there's 247 breastfeeding mothers just across the middle supporting each other. Um, we have an app, so the uh, Community Trust have developed a free app that's full of evidence-based information and points of contact, um, what they can expect, where they can go for support, and how they can link with other families. And also being sort of diverse, as I said, groups, home visits, telephone, text, hospital. Um, and the special care baby unit's massive because actually having support on that unit, if you look at the rates um, of baby head babies that are born early, it's quite high. Um, a lot of the teenage moms will deliver early as well, you know, so actually being able to have a point of contact in there when these babies are the sickest and actually need the breast the most. It's important we have a, a lead to help and where to go and we're developing some policies and some pathways to better support them. You know. So, sorry, can I just yeah. put in a little bit? Um, the, fund, uh, the pilot that we did for you from the Birkenhead constituency yes. ended um, in the end of January, um, but from the 1st of February we were part of this 0 to 19 contract, which meant that we were able to use the evidence of what we've done for you in the Birkenhead district to say this is how we want to work. With, with families in the future. So this is what we've done in Birkenhead District just since the 1st of February. Great. <coughs> so as you can see, the figures, 194 mums support dancing, 102 of them, Birkenhead mums received dancing and support, 35 of them initiated, 44 are still pregnant, and we will go on to breastfeed, um, and then into the, the different districts. Um, and again, this is what we're dealing with, so it's that, you know, M53 divide, um, and you're looking at, you know, Birkenhead trial, you know, in St James, 16% to 6 to 8 weeks, so that 37% looks a bit better when you actually see the, the rates that we're dealing with um, and how much those lighter areas need condensed support. Um, what do we yeah, hope to do? Yeah, I've got this last couple of slides, Frank. What do we hope to do to move forward? Um, you might have seen the breast milk to mating buses, you know, it's about creating, um, again, a, a breastfeeding culture, social marketing campaigns. Ongoing training for everyone interfacing with Birkenhead their families. I've, I've trained in the, uh, the refuge, um, you know, and, and other places in the Birkenhead district because it's about everybody that interfaces with breastfeeding families having some kind of knowledge and being able to 
debrief their own experience because a lot of the time they bring that into the sport figure. Um, I'm just in the process with Claire White at the other feeding lead of revamping the breastfeeding strategy and that needs to be implemented right across the world so that everybody's got a set of criteria that they need to work towards, um, whether that be social care, at least everybody needs some kind of form of education. Teenage antenatal group, uh, we've got one uh, teenage woman that's gone on to breastfeed for over a year and she's done the training and she's literally 16 when I met her and she's now wanting to start her own teenage breastfeeding group which is fabulous. Um, Scubu, as I said, and a stage approach to education, I think we need to start it, and I know this is one of your passions, Frank, but it needs to be right at the beginning. Um, you know, some of the research uh, Dr. Brown talks about is kids have made up their, their decisions about feeding by the age of eight. So actually, let's start at nursery. Um, and one small study that we did at Hagar School in Easton, a uh, very cheap, simple intervention. We removed the bottles from the um, holistic play areas, and we gave them spoons and bowls. We gave them some uh, resources supporting breastfeeding to just some books that show babies being breastfed. Um, a pre-intervention, 27 of the uh, 31 children, when asked how babies are fed, said babies are bottle fed, and four of them said breastfeeding. Um, after a six month intervention, and I think it cost about £52, um, 28 of them said breastfeeding, and three of them said bottle feeding. Very small intervention, very massive outcome, and I'd love to see that all out in the next Great. Can I ask you a question? Uh, yeah. It may not be part of this project, but I heard you talking about once a group of mums who had breast pain who buddied others who wanted to, and they could bring them at any time when it was really difficult feeding. Yeah. yeah there no. were babies. Do you still have that? I mean, we do have open access to the service all the time, and I think it's not that they're looking to one mum. Um, to one volunteer because of course these are volunteers from the call on call 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Well they know that everybody they get support from is a breastfeeding woman themselves. So that is basically what our model is. Yeah. I, I just thought, I mean, can you just, just very quickly about that mum Rock Ferry, that's all for this year? Yeah, I mean I supported one mum uh, in Rock Ferry who actually, she was terrified of anybody in a, in a locality knowing that she was breastfeeding and she didn't want me to wear my t-shirt when I did a home visit. She didn't want to breastfeed down and about. Um, because nobody in my area breastfeeds, and I don't want to stand outside. But that. she didn't even want a mum to know that she was breastfeeding. Yeah. She was in shape. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, come on, questions. Just a quick one. Yeah. Uh, what's the relationship between uh, having just been through the program? No, I'm not sneaking through this one of my daughters. Yeah, I know about that. Um, and, and it is a struggle at first. I don't know if you can mess around. No, no, it's not even going to say. Get this started with breastfeeding is painful. Yes. yes. It's yeah. and very uncomfortable and, and difficult yeah. and frustrating. Um, now, she and her friends all found the hospital-based service very inflexible in terms of supporting the initiation. Um, they wouldn't have top-up fees and all that kind of thing. Um, much more helpful, actually, when we start. Yeah. And very much better in responding quickly when there was a, a real problem of maybe trying for six hours without um, any frustrations that there were there. What's the relationship between the, the hospital service um, and, and yourself? Yeah, well, I mean, we are we've worked alongside the hospital ever since we started this project in 2009 or 2010. Um, but actually, you know, we are dealing with, you know, the NHS is in a struggle and there are very, you know, minimal staff hours. Um, we're on the hospital board seven days a week. Um, yeah, and we're, we're up at Agar Park and it's sometimes morning and evening shifts. Um, we work really closely with the feeding team, but there is, you know, we are told when we go into the yeah, we are. so there is a barrier and I think the information sharing protocol will hopefully overcome some of those barriers because these mums will have engaged and we're, we're, we're hearing too often that, that they yeah. have those We are hearing too often of mums that have had babies and don't know anything about it still. Yeah. Even though we've been going to be seven days service already. Sorry? Yeah. Providing seven days service already. Yeah. The health sector will be really pleased. Right. Can I just ask, I, mean, I, I assume all the medical evidence shows that babies who are breastfed grow up healthier and stronger yeah. than babies who are not. Is that a big part of your campaign to say to mothers, look, yeah. your yeah. baby will be yeah. better Yeah, I think healthier. it's not about bullying mums to breastfeed, yeah. it's about informed choice. And I think, you know, a lot of the time, you know, it is a skill and it's like, you know, could you ever dance if you've never heard music? It's about reskilling these women up to things thing. that they've never been, never seen, never been exposed to. But actually, if you haven't got all the information, then you didn't make an informed choice about how you want to feed them. Yeah. Any other questions? Brilliant project, well done. So you're not actually asking for more money, though. No, we just want to say thank you, actually. We want to say thank you.
<laughs> if you've got any more, you can also, I mean, we'd love to do the school project. Yeah. I think that would be huge, but um, no, it's enabled us to prove that actually doing more antenatal work is what is needed. Yeah. Well, thank you both. Because it, it, the, the major piece of research showed when, uh, when mums uh, who were pregnant asked, have you made up your mind? Um, most of them said yes, and they were then asked when. Yeah. And they did it, they said we made our minds up in the primary school. Yeah, and that's what, that is so what we're saying. So your project... We're phoning them at 12 weeks, yeah. but a lot of the yeah. thought we made our minds up. Yes. But I think if the, if the mums of the birth and constituency have children who see them breastfeed, we're dealing with that issue. You know, women modelling. But how much did that intervention cost again? £52. Well, we might, might take you. We haven't got a task and finish group on that, but we. I we can might send you the right up from Yeah, can you? Yeah. But, but we'll also um, consider that 52 quid. Yeah. You know, you just imagine. All right, great. Um, thank you both very, very much. Both for coming and giving the presentation, but also the work on it. It's been wonderful. Really good, thanks. <laughs> Can I just report on Crossways? We've had the meeting, George had the meeting with the residents, and I think that's progressing rather well. Uh, the other item, uh, Ken's worried about us being poor. Uh, a number of you have put in questions, um, and I, they are not this time allocated to councillors. So if people want to no, no, I don't want that. I do want my one because I've marked it up. With actually the key points in the answers. This is so slow, I can't find what I've done with it. Um, if we look at, and um, Joe, what's the first question? Yep, certainly. The first question is from Margaret Whiteley. She's asking about the query was I don't know who sends them, but can you do anything to stop the ex offenders selling door to door, please? I have just been verbally abused in my own home because I wouldn't buy anything. So that was the query. And then we got a response from Merseyside Probation Service who said that Merseyside Probation Service are not aware of any organisation that sponsors or supports ex-offenders to sell door to door. And certainly it's not something that would be supported by Merseyside Community Rehabilitation Company. So that's the answer to that. So we don't actually know who is doing these door to door selling. Um, and we can identify because we didn't have any more details about who it was apart from the information service which they said it didn't. Yeah. No, okay. Please. Please.
contract to private suppliers, and there's little we can do until there's a much more radical view about PFIs. So is Emma here? No? Alright, well that's the reply on that. On the one from, is Mr. or Mrs. Knapp here? About, um, the Blind Alley telephone call, which comes back to, could our task and finish group look at that one on front? Is that right? Well, yeah. question three. I think it is, yeah. 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 On, I mean, it sounds like more than LCT. John Brace's question on four. John, do you want to put it? We've got a reply for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll stand up and read it out so people can hear me. Yeah, uh, yeah, the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority decided recently to transfer the land by Birkenhead Fire Station to World Council for a youth zone, which will be called the Hive. I also discovered that councillors on Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority were receiving their allowances in full, but the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority was paying any tax or national insurance due, an arrangement that cost Merseyside council taxpayers an extra £10,820.28. These amounts for tax were not deducted from the allowances they received, but instead were paid by the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority. Could the Birkenhead Constituency Committee A, give an update on progress on the expected timescales for the youth zone called the Hive, and B, explain why some councillors are paying payroll taxes directly out of their allowances, whereas in other cases these taxes are paid not by the politician but by the public. It just seems a basic issue of fairness. Great. On A and B. On A, we'll ask for a report. On B, um, which is not um, actually on the agenda, but it's just been I gather they have, they have written and will continue to take up your points. Um, and the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority will answer your issues on that, John. On where are we with the hive? Jean's not here today, so I'm just tell us. Do you know? Um, yeah, um, that's the only information we've received. Um, I don't know exactly where the funding uh, is up to. Uh, I think I'm probably asking the same question. Yes. I mean, I think whatever the target date is, it's on target. And most of the money has been raised, hasn't it? So I think it's actually it's a huge sum. It's brilliant for people who have made contributions. So that will actually go ahead. And the police, the fire authority, um, John, are very happy to keep um, having a conversation with you by correspondence. On Francis Green, which is Francis here? I appreciate the financial, the financial difficulties, but I question whether full use of those people serving community services, community services is being made, and whether there are joint initiatives with the council and probation service. There's a long reply here. I have to say, as of all the new pieces of information, I was mega impressed by the contribution of the community service to some of our council services. Um, and by all means, if Frances Greenwood can go back to her and say, has she got other specific areas she'd like to see developments, I'm sure the probation service would put that up. But if you look at the work in Birkenhead Park, if you look at the work at Lambert and Set at, at, uh, at Cemetery, it's a very, very impressive. I mean, I'm not, you know, I know I shouldn't be so partisan, but I'm not terribly interested in seeking and all the rest of it. Where they've been working, but in Birkenhead, it's a really impressive list. And I, I wonder whether we, given we've got that reply from the probation service, we as a committee might write in fact as one of our action points. Is that all right? Yes. I think it's really impressive. That's a wonderful thing. Roy Wood, um, is that the way there? So we can find it. has gone. Um, uh, it was parking. Um, is Bob Giles here? Yes. Bob, would you like to put your question, please, to Fred? Thank you. Um, I asked a number of questions. I think yeah. that the, um, the most important one um, is, uh, of late is, is number two. What control measures are going to be introduced with regard to charity collectors known as chuggers? And chuggers being what? Chuggers are well, the, the abbreviation of charity muggers, right? And right. um, everybody here who walks around, if you drive, if you go to enclosed supermarkets or whatever, you will not be familiar with this. 
But I can tell you this, that I, I walk, and it's not just Birkenhead, this is nationwide. And there are basically organizations right out there, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right now, I'll give you an example. Yesterday, near Birkenhead Market, there was an outfit called Independent Age. Independent age, the idea behind it is, as you, again, you all well know, it's sign people up to direct evidence to contribute. Independent age and that lab was, and they, they have quite an aggressive sales pitch. Right? Incidentally, as an aside, I was near the uh, station uh, the other day, um, and there was a girl with a t-shirt on recruiting these charity Basically. This is supposed to be a question time, not a statement time. So, okay. can, I, can we come back on your three questions, right? Um, well, what's going to be done to control? Because basically you have situations now where you have charities which are out of control. Sure, I mean, I've got the point. Joe, um, and... Can, can, we, Frank, can we go on the point as well? Right. That many, many people, and I, I've been in the volunteer um, that I'm involved in, the Mackin Society, we go into source, right, into yeah. Tesco's and houses, whatever. And frequently now, people, there are people, best to define them, and they're wonderful people who basically want to give. And they will literally give to anything, right? And these people are being exploited by these organizations. There are some wonderful charities out there, but this is getting out of hand. What are you going to do to control? Well, so there are three questions. I want to, I'm going to go to Ken to answer the second, the technical one that Bob's raising. But on the first question, was we're all um, our council's contribution towards uh, the food bank. Um, the, the, uh, on Phil's initiative, uh, the council support the food bank in two very positive ways. But apart from Phil's time being one of the governors of it, they initiated so that the food bank could open its store by giving a, an industrial unit in the site between Berkeley and Wallasey. And Phil then um, gained a second site. Should the food bank, should um, the charity's national office allow them to, um, um, in a sense, respond to the initiative of fresh food and chilled food and frozen food, which not a number of suppliers wanted the food bank to give out, and, and Phil immediately got the council to agree to a second site. So it's been very positive, both in. in Councillor's involvement in the food bank, but also the resources. And on the drinking fountain, the library, uh, Chris is not here, the library, thought it's a really good suggestion, they're going to follow, it, follow up on it. And if you can make a note, they're going to come back to you um, actually on that poll. But on the second point, um, Ken, are you able to say what, the, what, what, the, what powers does the law give to the local authority to regulate these chuggers? Well, travel law is not my sort of um, sure. expertise, but um, I note what's been said here in relation to point two in response to the question. I also understand there's a new charity act as well, which I think is about to come into force. Um, I suggest that um, 